The world is a hot, sticky egg that fills her teeth with white static. She gasps, curling inward. She knows it's just a dream, one that no longer has any meaning. What has no meaning? The dream? This full reassurance? Herself? Crunched and strewn with shell flakes, she peels them off her skin. One by one, they titter and flay reluctantly, bit by bit, betraying raw, palliating olive membrane. Until the yolk of her tongue reveals itself, and she can no longer shape the words caught in her mouth. Until finally, they are all on the tough, matted floor. Until finally, she is a husk. A husk with no shell, yolk, or meaning. A frothy, begging mess of a creature. An emptiness that can only be satiated by seducing even more emptiness. Hunter without a cause, follower without a god, born without a womb. A cavity that resides among humans and living corpses. The girl they call the final messenger. Nern coughs, hacking up hours old bath water. Her fingers are frantic as they try to grasp onto the slippery edges of the bathtub, red water sloshing. Her knees knock against the sides, trying to shape themselves into something smaller. It takes a few minutes, but the thrashing finally stops when she becomes self-conscious, sinking into rust-stained water. Bubbles burst in front of her nose as she rises up again, half of her face still hidden, jaw pointed to the ceiling, eyes closed, breathing even. The filthy water has worn out its welcome, as the skin around her lips feels shriveled and raw, even itchy. She steps out of the bath and dries her long hair with a towel. The nape on her neck feels sticky and unclean. She goes over it with a thin towel again. It feels even rawer. It's somewhere between 4 to 5 a.m., but what does knowing the time matter? Days don't confine themselves to 24 hours anymore. They stretch on for endless eons The peaks and dips are indistinguishable from one another. Days and nights blend together, forming nightmarish patterns that last for weeks at a time. Forget time. She cannot even tell if she is alive, whether her foot is one door in the waking world or absolute purgatory. The trouble is not them when night comes, but herself. She has to keep herself fed, her restless, neurotic mind satiated with plans for a tomorrow she can't promise, from clawing and tearing her body inside out. It is not safe to linger too long in front of the window. The light has yet to catch up on the rest of the north. Nuren hasn't explored this part of the house yet. It's been abandoned, but only very recently. The owners must have moved when the news about a vampire infestation broke out. There remain some month-old preservatives and instant foods in the kitchen, which she'll inspect when her appetite returns. For now, there is yet more of the house to explore. As Nuren dresses into a blue and white raglan and zips a stranger's jeans, she looks into the mirror. All she sees is a tired 17-year-old with tousled dark hair and even darker circles under her eyes. The loss of weight doesn't help how prominent they're getting. She should get more sleep if she wants to appear as non-threatening as possible. But why even the attempt to check if she's still human? Most modern mirrors aren't backed with silver. Wait, are they? She shuffles around and restarts an old heater in the corner, which she never understood the point of until she moved back to Lancashire. Fruits have been placed on the counter. They are starving her on purpose, Nurin decides. Have they forgotten what humans eat for a meal? She picks one off the bowl and trails off into the next room. It's a bedroom this time, nothing signifying the gender of the child. All soft, neutral hues and muted greys, though by simple process of elimination, it seems to be a boy's room. Just slightly older than a toddler, perhaps? Chewing on scenery that leaves much to be desired and on the under right strawberry, she looks at the drawings closer. There's a pattern with the kids' drawings. Not in the usual way, where children draw houses and a stick figure family and a great big sun in the corner of the page, but something more off. There's always a figure lying down underneath every house they've drawn. Every figure looks the same, but the hair or clothes are colored differently. No one realizes it's a child's way of distinguishing that they're different people, as their skill hasn't caught up to their imagination yet. 
In this one, there's a woman with straw-colored hair lying beside a dog. In another, a big man with a beard. Beside him is a name crossed out by pen instead of a color pencil. And yet another, twin girls with ginger pigtails. And another, a boy in a bicycle. And another, another, and another. Sprawled across the room are drawings of shadowy figures lying in pools of crimson underneath the same house. It's at this point where Nurin realizes two things. One, she is living in a house previously owned by vampires or murderers of the non-blood-sucking variety. Two, she is not the only one who's been hired to lure in other humans. She suspected the second point for a while now, but this cemented it. Upon closer inspection, she noticed a woman with a different ethnicity from the family in the drawings and pictures. At first, she thought the woman was a servant or maid, but now she realized they hired a hunter just like her. She bears a similar insignia on her chest. It stands to reason that the Edivanes wouldn't have stationed her in an abandoned house of humans but other vampires as well. Abruptly, a knock echoes through the hall downstairs. Must be my next assignment, Nurin thinks. It's not like the family who lived here are coming back. She cautiously but quickly makes her way down, steps creaking along the way. Through the people, she can see it's Kirin, the Edwin chauffeur. He's one of the harder vampires to understand as he unloads her next task in a thick Irish accent. Nurin is to travel further up north where the next town is. Kirin will take her to the edge of town, where she is to scout for the next victim. It seems that each week she has to travel further and further to avoid garnering attention to the area and intruding on the territories of other vampires. She understands the risk, but it tires her to think of the logistics of bringing an extra body on the way back. Still, she accepts a task without question. Thank you, Kirin. Anything else? Nothing you need to worry about, miss. He gruffly replies. Ah, and I assume this request is by... Victor, the head of the Edivain household. A strikingly tall and darkly alluring man of few words. It's odd. The man just had his fill two days ago. It seems that as each day passes, he grows more ravenous. Noren chooses not to comment on it, however, as she makes her way back upstairs to pack for the task ahead.